You're watching Healing from GMOs by Dr. Lisa Gall on Resonance Wellness TV, part of our Whole Life Medicine Alleviate series. Keep in the loop about future webinars and events on whole-life-medicine.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Healing from GMOs. My name is Dr. Alyssa Gall, and I will be your host and guide this evening. And as usual, this is a webinar that is brought to you by Whole Life Medicine. Um, it's part of our Alleviate series of webinars, and Alleviate is the first step in the Whole Life Medicine approach to patient guidance. And we're talking about GMO um, and GMO toxins. We're, we're definitely talking about how they might be coming from your diet. Um, so dietary problems, of course, is one of the root causes of ill health. We're also talking about the possibility of strengthening detoxification in a person using a clean slate process. And often this requires us to put in missing ingredients because detoxification requires specific nutrient cofactors. So we're going to take a look at GMOs um, and what's known and what is not about their use and effect. And um, this <laughs> this webinar really reminded me about how passionate I was about this subject and still am um, from from over over 20 years of practice. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these things as we're going through. So let's start by taking a look at what what is a GMO or what is a genetically modified organism. So GMO is a living organism whose genetic material has been modified. So the impulse to use genetic modification started in the 80s when artificial transfer of genes between plants became possible because there were a lot of emerging cell technologies at that time. And But within about 10 years, so by the 1990s, we were already seeing GMOs marketed in the US, United States as commercial crops. And by 15 years um, after the start of it, there were retail um, genetically modified organisms available um, on the market. Um, the first ones were soy and squash. And this is actually a remarkably short time frame from the science end to the commercial end. So genetically modified organisms are created through a kind of genetic engineering where plants, animals, bacteria, and sometimes viral DNA, viral genes are combined in a way that doesn't naturally occur otherwise. So a gene is a segment of DNA that encodes for a phenotypic expression of some type. So a phenotype is something that's observable in an organism. So as an example, you might have the phenotype of blue eyes versus brown eyes or brown hair versus blonde hair. That's a phenotype. So it's something recognizable about the organism. So the goal in genetically modified organisms is to get a plant to create um, a protein that results in some sort of phenotypic expression. So originally there were quite a few techniques used to see if you could even produce random mutations to make like better varieties of plants, for example. So um, one example of that was foods bombarded with radiation. And why we bombarded foods with radiation was to see if random genetic mutations would result in plant traits that were actually useful. It was a, it, it, it's very random. Like when I say random mutations, um, we've long known that radiation creates mutations in DNA. So the thought was if we bombarded enough with mild radiation, um, organisms that we might see variants show up um, that could potentially be marketable. It's it's an interesting sort of kind of, this is kind of where we're getting that Franken food sort of um, approach or term from. So um, there was also plants where we forced um, the chromosomal numbers to stay um as what's called polyploid. So basically, so that in normal cell division, you actually have to get rid of a certain amount of genetic material to have normal chromosome counts at the end of cell division. And so people figured out how to actually force the um, seeds of um, seeds or, or basically like fish eggs, even how to keep it 
from expelling the extra genetic material and to, to actually make a, a plant with or an animal with too many sets of chromosomes. And um, so a great example of this is the seedless watermelon. Like that's that's an abnormal, that's actually technically a genetically modified product. It's not the same as gene splicing, which we're gonna talk about in a sec, but it's where we forced the plant to maintain um, genetic material that it normally would have um, extruded. So we're normally talking, when, I, when I'm talking to you about genetically modified organisms today, we're mostly talking about plants that have had modifications that are directly um, interventions on the DNA. So I thought it might be a great idea to actually look at what we're talking about here. So let's take a look at what, what it means to create a genetic modification. So don't panic when you see this slide. <laughs> In essence, on the on the left hand side here, I'm just um, used a couple of like standard textbook illustrations to give you a sense of like the normal production of proteins from a gene um, starting in the nucleus of the cell. So on the top here, we have DNA. So what this is showing us is unwound um, nucleotides on a chromosome. So in order to actually translate um, the genetic code into a protein, you have to take those chromosomes and actually unwind them a lot. And I'm, I, I don't have enough time to give you as uh, like a full sense, full biology lesson on how we do this, but suffice it to say that these top pieces are like strings of DNA. And so what happens in, in genetic, um, the genetic production of a protein is you unwind the DNA, you actually take it apart slightly because it has... Um, a two-sided structure to it. So you, you unwind it, you take it apart um, as two strings, and then one side of the string is actually replicated. And it's replicated in a kind of copy, like a photocopy type of a material that's called messenger RNA. So in essence, what you do is you unzip the DNA, you make a copy of one side of it, and that messenger um, RNA comes out of the nucleus of the cell into the cytoplasm of the cell, so where all of the activity is taking place that's um, more to do with the metabolism, and it binds to a ribosome. So there's also some sequences in the middle here. So you can see here that there's sequences that are removed from the, um, from the copied version so that when you go to translate it into a protein, that you're actually translating just the gene itself. So what the gene is coding for is amino acids. And every three nucleotides in, an, in a messenger RNA and in gene, originally on the DNA, is coding for a specific amino acid. And so there's a mechanism in the cell where um, a different kind of, of um, uh, RNA, it's called transfer RNA, takes an amino acid on the one end and matches it to a three nucleotide sequence on the mRNA using an organelle called the ribosome. Now, this is, might be a stretch back to high school um, biology, <laughs> but in essence, what, you're, what you do is you are building an amino acid chain, which is a protein, from the coding on your DNA, RNA. RNA mRNA sequence. So you get a finished protein and here on this on this bottom of the left hand side here it says post translation of modification. So proteins don't typically just go around as amino acid strings. They they actually have a 3D structure to them. So they fold in a, in a number of different ways. So you get this finished protein that's a 3D product that has a shape and a configuration and a sequence of the original um, protein. Now, when you genetically modify something, what you typically will do is at the gene level, you will enzymatically break the DNA strands. So there are known enzymes that normally change um, the expression of DNA. So we're using enzymes that already exist biologically to cut DNA and insert genes of interest into a functioning genome in a living creature. So if it's as a plant, or often it's a bacteria, um, or technically it could be an animal, and I'll give you a, a case where that's true. 
So you can take out a gene and insert it into the genome and then have that cell um, translate that new gene into a protein for you. So on the right hand side here, this is actually a example of um, a BT gene being inserted using a bacterial plasmid. Okay. So when you do this, you're going to actually just create a sequence that that cell is going to produce. So all the cells of a plant or all the bacteria that you modify this way are going to create the, the BT gene product. Okay, so we're going to step back for just a second. So proteins are really in eight big categories. So when you actually translate your genetic material into a set of proteins, there's eight big categories of things that you basically make with that. You make enzymes, you make structural proteins, like the things like collagens and things that build your structure. You make molecules that um, have other actions like hormones are produced this way. There are protein hormones. You can make immune proteins like antibodies. Um, proteins that store things like iron, so a hemoglobin structure is um, a genetically coded protein that helps carry iron in your body. You make receptors, which are in, on the outside of cells or other tissues um, that respond to things that float by. And you make contractile proteins, just like, like, those, the, like the ones that contract your heart, as an example, or your muscle. So human beings have about 21,000 genes, and that codes for all sorts of different proteins, obviously. And interestingly, plants have more genes than humans, about 20,000 more on average. But what is interesting is that human beings can code for about 200,000 protein products with our 20 or 1,000 or so genes, depending on the, how the sequences in between genes are used. So a genetic modification has the impact of not just changing one gene product or function, but to potentially many gene products and functions, because it isn't just one gene, one protein. Sometimes, like I said, you can splice products and create different proteins depending on what you need. So RNA also has functions other than just coding for proteins. So even though some of those genetic modifications that are being attempted are technically aiming at one gene, they can have much bigger impacts on the function of genetic material. So when those genes are modified, you're adding a gene into a genome to make a new protein product. Now, why would you do this? You know, before genetic modifications, we just bred plants or bred animals to see if we'd accentuate those useful phenotypic traits that we saw by breeding certain individuals together. And that is actually called breeding or hybridization, depending on, you know, what kingdom you're talking about. So at present, there's a number of reasons suggested for why we would bother creating genetically modified organisms. So plants are, are genetically modified to increase their ability to handle direct herbicide applications. There may be attempts to modify them to produce their own insecticide. And that's what we're actually seeing on the right-hand side of this diagram. We're seeing the production of, of, um, of uh, Bacillus thuringiensis um, protein. So I'm going to talk to you about that in a sec. But you can also attempt to create longer shelf lives in plants or, or like in vegetables, final products. Or you can actually try and make an entirely new organism by genetically modifying it. You can't, of course, produce a new biological being. That technology does not exist. Genetically um, modifying organisms is quite crude. So I don't want you getting the idea like it's super designer and fancy. It's actually not as designer and fancy as you would possibly think it is, considering um, the fact that we're attempting to use it as a technology. So here on the right, you can see how a gene can be incorporated into a plant. So this is the example of the BT gene from Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a soil bacteria, and hence the name BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. So this bacteria makes more than one protein that's 
um, tox that are toxic to many um, different kinds of insects. So in this example, the Bt gene from the bacteria is isolated, it's cut out and inserted into the genome of corn. And then the corn makes the protein that's toxic to insects. So amongst the manipulations that you can do with genetic modification include this kind of transferring of genes from potentially a totally unrelated organism or sometimes related, modifying information in a gene by editing the gene so you can actually pull pieces of nucleotides out, moving or deleting or like I said multiplying genes within a living organism like we talked about the chromosomes um, being duplicated or allowed to maintain in duplicate when they normally wouldn't be or splicing together pieces of existing genes or completely constructing new ones. So at this time there isn't really convincing evidence that this goal of increasing yield or enhancing nutrition or advancing tolerance to environmental challenges has really fully been met. So as an example or as it stands now there's a lot of consumer doubt and there's confusion and there's um, there are issues. <laughs> there are issues within this industry. So let's just take a look at um, genetically modified organisms worldwide. So there are over 60 countries worldwide that at least require the labeling of GMO products. And as, a, as an example, Australia, Austria, Belgium, um, places as far away as Bolivia, Brazil, Cameroon, China requires labeling of GMOs, um, Croatia, Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Ecuador, I'm doing them in alphabetical order, El Salvador, Estonia, Ethiopia, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Iceland, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malaysia, Mali, Malta, Mauritius, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Peru, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Senegal, Slovakia, Slovenia, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, Sri Lanka, Sweden, Switzerland, Taiwan, Thailand, Taiwan, Tunisia, Turkey, the Ukraine, the United Kingdom, and Vietnam. Those are just the ones I've got on my list right now. I'm, I think there's probably a few more. So did you notice Canada and the United States did not make that list? In fact, Canada is the third largest producer of GMO crops in the world. So when labeling laws were proposed in Canada, 88% of Canadians wanted GMO products labeled. The government decided it would create commercial problems for producers and so allowed it to be voluntary for manufacturers to label food products containing GMOs. Canada has really been criticized for how it approves GMOs, certainly also in the United States, although the, the approval process is a bit different. Basically in Canada, we just evaluate studies coming from the production companies that are producing these GMOs. There are not independent studies performed in Canada. Um, and the decision-making process by Canada is done behind closed doors. There's no consultation processes with farmers or consumers. So even in the U.S., in the U.S., I think uh, the surveys just done in 2015 showed 93% of Americans think that GMOs should be labeled, but they don't have a labeling requirement there either, and it's not going to be coming in the near future. In the United, um, in the European Union, GMOs are tested a lot. They're tested for several years in small applications, and many of the GMOs there have their approvals um, withdrawn after those testing periods. In fact, by 2010, there was really only one crop of um, BT corn, this is why I'm using this example that I showed you, that was approved for cultivation in, in Europe. Many countries banned GMOs altogether. There are very strict rules there about the distance that have to be maintained between genetically modified crops and non-genetically modified crops because there are fears and data showing that GMO technology from one plant could contaminate crops of non-genetically modified um, plants if they're allowed to pollinate. Then we saw what was called Terminator technology. I don't know if you remember this, but Terminator technology was attempted in the US. And what that technology was, was to try and make plants unable to reproduce after the genetic modification, and then to create, um, create seeds that 
could only be externally manipulated into growing it or reproducing. So that technology was banned in the European Union by 2006. Um, that technology did not really become commercially viable, mostly because there was opposition from farmers. Because in essence, if you have a plant with terminal, terminator technology, they'd be forced to buy the chemicals that were the signaling molecules. And as it is now, they're often forced to buy new seed instead of saving seeds for the next year's crops, because that's actually against the agreement when you decide to grow those kinds of seeds. So in essence, you're taking some of the traditions of, of agriculture completely out um, of normal farming. Now, um, aside from labeling initiatives, um, there actually are 300 regions in the world that completely ban growing and distribution of genetically modified organisms. Um, when I first moved to England in 1998, I this was after graduation, um, I entered a country that was literally up in arms about GMOs entering the food system. I had barely heard about this problem in naturopathic medical school, and I really was not aware of how intense the debate was in the European Union, given at the, that time I was living in the U.S. And so the U.S. media has, has ties to the companies who were making these products. And they kept it very, very quiet. Um, so quiet, in fact, that most people didn't realize that there were substantial challenges to the commercial efforts of American companies to go across the world and try and put these plants in various locations across the European Union. Um, in fact, in the UK, when I was living there, every major supermarket chain voluntarily removed every GMO product off their shelves within the year. Um, it was also the year that France refused to allow GMO testing on French soil. So that was a major diplomatic situation. I think the American ambassador to France um, was recalled for a short time or there was some threat of recalling them because Americans were attempting to force the French to accept GMO testing on their soil. Now, this was a big deal. And like I said, there was not a whisper of this showing up in the media of Canada and the United States, um, which are the country, we are the countries that are producing these plants. And yet you, you didn't hear anything about it. You know, you, you kind of see smatterings of things show up in the media here, highly controlled most of the time, but um, it, it was really, it was not apparent um, when I got back and I searched the media for any indication that this was happening. Um, you just couldn't find it. It was so well suppressed in North America. So the safety of GMOs is relatively speaking, not well known. And so what ended up happening is that obviously individual citizens started becoming aware of this and taking matters into their own hands and choosing kind of to opt out of this experiment. <laughs> and so there is a lot of, um, evidence that's showing that GMOs could be connected with health problems and environmental issues and even the violation of like farmer and consumer rights. So let's look at where GMOs are. So GMOs are in the vast majority of our food supply. And why is that? It's because of the desire to use more pesticides on crops and prevent crop loss to insects. And there's a couple of major crops where this has been an issue. Um, Canada, as an example, is a main producer of GMO canola, soy, corn, and sugar beets. And unfortunately, it's only a portion of where the GMOs are in our food, but that's the majority of the um, GMO plants that we're producing. Other common sources are things like papaya, um, zucchini, summer squash, tomatoes, um, beef products, and we'll talk about that in a second flax, potatoes, apples, um, artificial sweeteners are actually a genetically modified produced product. And um, most processed foods will contain genetically modified ingredients. So I hope you're not freaking out quite yet. <laughs> I can hear the refrain of Tim. Tim, are you on this call? <laughs> so um, corn is it's basically the 
most genetically modified crop in Canada and the United States. So it's very concerning how much it's showing up in our diets, often without people knowing. So the two main reasons why that's happening is it's cheap. You know, food manufacturers can buy corn at very low prices because there's subsidies in corn's favor. Um, the use of corn is uh, widely diversified. So it's used as a filler, it's used as an emulsifier, it can be used as a sweetener, a preservative, a texturizer. There's aspects of it that are used as adhesives and so much more. And there's lots of products that are actually produced for the processed um, food um, arena that are made out of corn. So corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, corn starch, modified corn starch, corn meal. Um, you can make corn oil, corn flour, corn sweeteners. Um, people eat grits, not so much in Canada, hopefully as in the United States. And maize, like people, um, this is another form of eating corn. Uh, polenta, there's just so many applications for those products. They're used in standard food manufacturing um, and you probably don't even realize how much of that is actually going into some of the products that we're consuming. Now, I said I would mention the potential for meat. So GMOs found in meat is kind of a bit of a tricky subject. Most of the genetically modified organisms that are produced today go towards feeding meat animals. GMO, corn, and soy. Um, you also have other crops like alfalfa that are genetically modified that may also be service feed. Um, so those animal feeds um, go towards dairy cows. So you can get proteins from genetically modified plants in dairy products. Um, the GM feed that animals consume basically is going to remain in their systems at the time of like human beef consumption. So it doesn't matter if they're getting it through alfalfa or corn or soy, you're going to be subjected to eating those crops through the meat and um, dairy product and like egg consumption from chickens if they're eating that stuff. There are genetically modified salmon that have already been sent to market in the last couple of years. Um, those fish have been modified to increase growth rates. So it's basically taking an Atlantic salmon and maturing it by genetic modification in half the time it would typically take. So it's a GMO made from injecting growth hormone genes from Chinook salmon and a promoter gene from another fish um, into Atlantic salmon. And these are actually have a brand name to them. They're called Aqua, Aqua Advantage Salmon. <laughs> Um, you could also have eaten um, other kinds of triploid fish, like not genetically modified, but triploid fish like the watermelon we were talking about. Um, those are like the sterile fish that are usually used to stock lakes. So like brown trout stock or rainbow trout may actually come from this kind of like triploid non-breeding fish. Um, bananas are also triploid. I forgot to mention that with the watermelon. So we're starting to see things eking into the food supply through areas where you wouldn't anticipate that that's actually happening. And we don't have um, lots of rules about that in some ways, but we're gonna talk about rules in a second. First, we're gonna take a look at some of the potential adverse effects of putting GMOs into the diet. So, um, it's been shown that there are definitely a couple of main categories of adverse events. Number one is if you alter a gene pathway, you can inadvertently create proteins that have allergenic potential or the potential for toxicity or changes in nutritional composition of that product. The second thing is that actual gene products can be toxic to us or obviously other creatures in the environment if the organism is being modified to produce a toxin. The, um, a lot of those plants are being produced to withstand extra amounts of pesticides or herbicides, and that's um, really increasing the amount of pesticide found on and around the plant. So you're eating that pesticide or herbicide, and then it's also contaminating the soil. 
Um, in fact, some of these seeds are designed to grow under conditions that probably biologically would not be withstandable in a natural world. So there are quite a few animal studies showing interesting changes to animal physiology and disease processes over the short term. There's really not a lot of studies researching the effect over the long term. Um, and we don't know sometimes how chronic ingestion can affect an animal over one lifetime or across even generations of that same creature. Um, those types of studies are not required for regulatory approval. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So rats that are fed Monsanto's GM maize and tiny amounts of Roundup herbicide, um, which the maize is, is engineered to tolerate, over a two-year period develop severe liver and kidney damage, disturbance to pituitary gland function, and hormonal disruption. There were also unexpected findings of um, increased rates of large palpable tumors and premature death in some levels of treatment group. Um, rats fed GM BT maize. So again, BT corn, like we were just talking about, there was a variety that was developed by Monsanto for the Egyptian market. And in 45 to 91 days showed differences in organ and body weight and blood biochemistry um, compared with non GM fed um, rats in the same conditions. So um, in essence, it was just noted that those changes could indicate potential adverse health or toxic effects. And, you know, often there's a call for further investigation that just never happens. Um, rats fed GM tomatoes over a 28 day period developed stomach lesions. Um, so sores or ulcers, basically high unexplained mor um, mortality. So that means death in GM fed rats for those tomatoes seven out of the 40 rats fed those tomatoes died within two weeks of the start of the experiment this was the tomato called the calgene flavor saver it was one of the first commercialized gm foods um, this study actually was produced by the company itself it wasn't peer-reviewed or published it was only forced into the public domain by a lawsuit suit that was brought into uh, brought to the court by a public interest group called the alliance for biointegrity in the united states um, mice fed GM peas engineered with insecticidal proteins from beans showed strong sustained immune reactions against that protein. So mice started developing antibodies against the GM protein and an allergic type inflammation response. So basically like an IgG reaction, like what we test for to foods. Also, the, mess, uh, the mice that fed on the peas um, developed immune reactions to chicken egg white protein. Um, so this is basically showing that the GM insecticidal protein could act as a sensitizer and make the mice susceptible to developing immune reactions and allergies to normally non-allergenic foods. Um, that's a process that's called immunological cross-priming. And it's totally possible that that could happen in human beings. Um, mice fed for five consecutive generations with GM herbicide tolerant triticale, that's um, a kind of wheat rye hybrid, showed enlarged lymph nodes, increased white blood cells, um, a significant decrease in a type of white blood cell called a T lymphocyte in the spleen and the lymph nodes, and B lymphocytes, another kind of white blood cell, and lymph nodes in blood. Um, so those are cells involved in immunity. Um, mice fed GM soy over a two-year period, showed um, changes in liver cell metabolism, stress response, calcium signaling, it, the, the liver aged more significantly compared to the control group. Um, you, I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you the top of the pile here. Rats being fed GM potatoes for 10 days showed excessive growth of the lining of the gut similar to a precancerous condition. Um, as well as toxic effects in multiple organ systems. You know, I'm giving you all these animal studies. Human studies are not very common, oddly. You know, considering how much GMO we could possibly take in, it's super curious. Um, but I'll give you a couple. So in a study on human volunteers fed a single GM soybean meal, you could find intact genetically modified DNA in surviving processing detected in, in the digestive tract, there was also evidence for the presence of those gene units in the food undergoing digestion. And there was 
um, what's called horizontal gene transfer of that of the genetically modified gene to gut bacteria. So horizontal gene transfer is where DNA is transferred from one organism to another through mechanisms other than reproduction. That is something that typically happens much more in bacteria and lower levels of organisms. It doesn't typically happen like in the mammalian DNA or higher. Um, like in human DNA, you don't usually see that. Um, even plants to a degree don't don't show that kind of transfer between plants. Sometimes they do. It depends on the, the level of plant life. There was also a study showing immune response to um, non-genetically mo modified soybeans um, comparing to genetically modified soybeans where the skin test results from 49 patients showed that 13 had immune responses to the non-GM soybeans and 8 to GM. Um, and then in essence, you created a sense, um, you could actually create new allergies not predictable from the original person's immune response. So it's a kind of creating a set of circumstances where we can see why, why people are increasing in immune problems against foods, because it's certainly, that has certainly increased in the last 20 years that I've been watching. Um, there are um, GM soy varieties modified with a gene from Brazil nuts that actually increased um, Brazil nut allergy. Um, so there was a study that was conducted in Canada that, sh that showed that levels of that insecticidal protein um, in, a pl in a GMBT crop actually was circulating in the blood of pregnant and women and in the blood supply to fetuses. So how the BT toxin protein got into the blood was actually unclear in this study. So, um, you know, there's, it's raising questions about why GMBT crops are being commercialized without investigating where those proteins are going. So if you watch the YouTube video that I sent you, I don't know if you saw that, but it, it was a former, um, there's a woman named Robin O'Brien. She's a former business analyst whose child had an allergic reaction um, to breakfast, to what she considered a normal breakfast, which I think was like a breakfast cereal and eggs and a kind of yogurt. Um, and it triggered a huge shift in her because she started to realize that Americans are really affected by some of these products. They have the highest rates of cancer in the world. Allergies in the United States to common foods are on the rise. She figured out that in regulation of genetically modified foods, there's some pretty fishy stuff that's going on. And she authored a book that was called The Unhealthy Truth. Um, she was actually a food industry analyst. And the more she learned about this aspect of the food industry, the more she actually became an activist. She, she actually says in the video, if you had a chance to watch it, she could totally understand the business reasons why you would want a genetically modified product. I mean, it was a, a beautiful design to create a monopoly. Um, it totally makes sense from a business perspective, but from a health perspective um, and a people perspective, it did not. And so she's actually done a lot of um, research onto the impact that the global food system is having on the health of children in spe specifically. I hope I'm not freaking you out quite yet. <laughs> well, maybe I am and maybe I'd like to. Um, so I want to add one aspect here um, to this this discussion, which um, usually doesn't get talked about. And I'm, I'm going to go like just kind of slightly to the left and into this field that is considered a bit on the left side of physics, but it exists. So there was a man who unfortunately died about two years ago. His name was Fritz Albert Popp. He spent most of his career spend, um, studying um, the emission of light uh, by biological living organisms. And what he found actually, and th this wasn't his discovery entirely, it, was, it has been discovered before, but he studied it in much more detail. So he discovered that all living things emit tiny amounts of coherent light. What I mean by coherent light is light that comes off of a plant or an animal in a plane. Like, so when we do ART in the office, 
you, you probably don't realize that, but this that is a photon resonance block that's beside your head. And I'm also using a polarization filter to ascertain how coherent the overall biophotonic emissions are off of your body. Now, I don't have a lot of time to explain what that means in, in an office visit, but in essence, the more, co more coherent the light coming off of a, off of a person, the, the healthier they are. Now, what Fitz Albert Pop um, discovered was that this faint biophoton emission. So a photon is a quanta of light, visible light. It's a faint radiation in the background. Obviously, most people don't glow or most plants don't grow, glow to our own senses. I'm, I'm going to argue that point in a moment. But what he found was that faint biophotonic radiation was really a driving force behind chemical activity in an organism. So Pop theorized that the light was a coordinator of biological processes. And he counted the light. Photon by photon, he demonstrated that the light frequencies were mainly emitted by DNA. So if a cell was ill, the current would go sharply up or down in amount of light emissions. So if you applied a medicine by ointment, the whole body's biophotonic structures responded to the application. So um, cancer victims have fewer photons, for example. Stress increases the amount of light emissions. So Pop discovered that this biophotonic emission is also a type of communication between living things. Light patterns are sent back and forth in a type of conversation. So Chinese colleagues of Pop tried to do this with algae, and they showed that blue-green algae have a highly sophisticated signaling system between um, samples of algae. Bacteria do this. Even the white and yolk of an egg, uh, of an egg will communicate with its, um, with its shell. So there are sections. Um, if you take a green bean and you cut it up into sections, they would add, the sections would emit light in between them to communicate between pieces. So the light was still communicating with the amputated part of the bean. And potentially, you know, this might even be part of what you see maybe with um, that phantom limb effect when people have a limb amputated even. So what he found were there were day and evening light emissions. So it would vary with the, the conditions of day and night. It would vary over weeks and months and uh, related to sun position, where the sun actually was. So it is such a shame that this man passed away two years ago. He was um, such, he was doing such interesting research. Um, he had um, a lab in Germany, and then he actually also became part of the, I think it's the Department of Consciousness at Princeton um, in the United States. And so he did this beautiful research, and this, these pictures are just showing um, emissions from various seeds and cells and plants and humans as biophotonic emissions. Um, and so I am personally very concerned that the biggest potential risk of a genetically modified organism is that by interrupting DNA, you screw up biophotonic emissions. If biophotons are part of the interior communications of the cell, then you're screwing up intracellular communication. So you, you've got to start to wonder how much of an impact this is actually having. And years ago, I've never met Fritz Albert Pop, um, but about, I guess this is about 15 years ago when I first um, heard about this research in a workshop environment. And it was a workshop in Arizona. And um, interestingly, at the same workshop, um, uh, I met um, a handful of, of people. I met Bruce Lipton, who is the author of The Biology of Belief. I don't know if you've ever seen any of his, of his work, but he's a wonderful um, researcher and a very good presenter. And he happened to be in this small workshop that I was attending at the um, request of the uh, of one of my uh, mentors in medicine, Dietrich Klinghart, who is an MD PhD from Germany. Wonderful people. And um, in this workshop, it was discussed about how a genetically modified organism has fundamentally um, different biophotonic emissions 
than a normal natural plant. And so that was just, I think, doing biophoton uh, photon on just even genetically modified seeds. It was substantially changed. And so in my mind, this is actually one of the things that, again, from a research perspective, is not going to drop into the common knowledge, um, but is going to create a big problem because we don't actually understand what we're doing when we're doing this random stuff. <laughs> and it is random. Let me tell you, it looks like we're doing something that's so official and so cell technology, but I can tell you it is not nearly as elegant as that. So the more that I thought about that, it really brought up this question to me, like, how did this happen? Like, what is wrong with us that we do this? I really feel like sometimes the worst thing that happens to us as human beings is hubris. We just, we have this idea that somehow we're so incredibly smart that we're smarter than mother nature. And I feel like we are repeatedly proven wrong over this, over this problem that we have. And the problem is there is no, you know, quote unquote, them protecting you. We all have to take some responsibility for helping to keep ourselves and our communities accountable for this kind of experimentation and our tendency to start to think about commercial applications before we even figure out the basics. I remember grant writing time in the department that I was in during my undergraduate um, degree in university. And it was a chaos of swearing students and profs trying to come up with grant applications that would suit the particular group granting the funds because everybody needed funds for their research. And a lot of the swearing was about having to try to create an application for basic science research. So basic science research is when we just sit down doing studies to figure out how things work. So at this point, we already spend less than half of what we did post World War II on basic research. Um, we have literally decreased how much time and effort we spend figuring out how things work and we jump right over it to corporate applications. And I really feel like um, so much of our economy is based on these jumping over the details so that we get some sort of commercially viable product. And like I said, there are literally departments in universities right now that are writing grants to try and appeal to funding agencies who are really interested in commercially viable products. It's a horrible disservice to us all. We don't allow basic research to exist. Now, the other aspect is we are allowing conglomerates to use our, you know, quote unquote, legal system to their advantage in, in basically in ways that undermine basic justice, because we don't have a justice system, we have a legal system. And there are lots of governments um, who, who allow GMOs, whose officials are just too close of a relationship to the industries that they're ostensibly regulating. And I don't think we can argue that Canada isn't one of them. So in any case, I just really want to advocate here for just stepping back and really thinking this through and allowing some of these issues that we have with our health um, to inspire small actions even. It doesn't even need to be a big action, frankly. <laughs> I'm satisfied with a small action. And so here's a small action. How are we gonna avoid genetically modified organisms? And honestly, the single most effective way is to just like not eat them. So you can see here, there's a symbol for the non-GMO project. That's a verifier of non-GMO status for manufactured products. You Maybe you've seen this logo on things that you've eaten before and not realized what it was about. Um, in this country, organic is the only non-GMO standard that's overseen by the Canadian government. So in Canada, organic standards forbid the use of GMOs in seeds, in animal feed, and ingredients of a processed organic food or organic product. So if you are concerned about genetically modified organisms, eating things labeled organic in this country will let you avoid GMOs. You can also shop for wild products, wild fish, things that cannot have been genetically modified. Um, you can buy organic Seeds for your garden. You know, that's basically normal agriculture of like crossing plants by pollination, just not genetically modified. Ask where your foods are coming from. Um, 
you know, if you go to your grocery store and you actually ask the question, every time you ask a question, anywhere you are, the more awareness you're creating. Support your local organic farmer. Take your kids to farms so they can see where food comes from, like, and how hard it is to produce. Spend your time researching, like, what restaurants are bringing in or what grocery stores are doing what and what brands seem to be really aware. I personally have a CSA share in um, Biodynamic Organic Farm um, up in Carstairs. It produces meat and veggies and eggs and partners with other farmers, basically of like mind, to bring in things like fruit and cheese and bread and other products, all, you know, done the old fashioned way, totally organic. And in the case of my farm, Biodynamic, which is where instead of any pesticides or herbicides, they are using homeopathics and crop rotations and all of those beautiful um, um, agricultural suggestions that were brought by Steiner. So I see the comment here from Holly about buying um, pasta from Europe. Um, how long? Um, they're not going to be pressured to use GMOs um, because they are very cognizant of this in the European Union. Um, Bayer did buy out Monsanto. So Bayer is the major pharmaceutical manufacturer and you've seen it in Bayer's aspirin. Um, they have been absolutely inundated with lawsuits in Europe. Um, and then obviously they have to clean up all these lawsuits in the United States now that they've acquired Monsanto. And the European Union rules are very strict, Holly. Um, they are, and that, and it's not just European Union, but even though the individual countries of the European Union have some latitude, um, they they really are doing this amazing job. Like I said, when I moved to England, I was completely gobsmacked by how much was being done. They literally stripped GMOs out of like Safeways, Tesco's, Sainsbury's. These are all the major chain supermarkets in the United Kingdom, you know, serving that huge population. And that, that was just the beginning of it in the United Kingdom. Um, and that was true all around Europe. People are very close to their food. You know, they have much more markets and they're closer to like they have a, a different style of of um like making their food they don't have big deep freezes like we have here out on the bald ass prairie <laughs> they tend to eat food like one um day at a time so they buy and then they go home and they eat so the farm that i used um that i use and i have for many years is blue mountain um, biodynamic farm that is in car stairs they sell shares once a year um, in spring you'll want to get on their um, email list to be notified because it's literally first come first served and um, the man who made biodynamics happen was steiner this is steiner as in Anthropos rudolph steiner as in um, anthroposophy steiner i've mentioned him many times um, and so this is like organic taken to the max. And so, so much life force energy. Like I can tell you, like the, the products that I'm getting off that farm, they, they're vital. They last long. They're, um, nutrition, very nutritious. I can, I can tell the quality of the product and, and, um, and the eggs I'm getting produced from there and chickens. And, um, so. It's, it's totally an option. You know, invest in the people that you know are doing it right, I think. So, um, like I said, eat organic. You're going to skip a lot of the, the harsh details <laughs> because you're going to be able to, like, skip GMOs just by buying organic. In Canada, by definition, an organic product is GMO-free. Now, if you look at detoxification from, from GMOs, there's certain things like we don't know exactly how efficient the body is going to be in eliminating proteins that are produced by GMOs. Nobody's ever done studies about that, really. Like I said, other than the ones I've mentioned, I can tell you that a radioactively labeled cow milk protein, not genetically modified, but just normal cow milk proteins that you drink are shown to be absorbed and transmitted unchanged and undigested through breast milk. Your body's intelligent. It brings something in, it identifies what it is, and then it tries to reuse it. 
So what happens when you bring in a protein that you have no idea what that is? Nobody knows. It's anybody's guess. We have smart systems, but we don't know what happens when we take in some of these things. So it's totally possible if it's not a protein our systems are familiar with, it could totally create problems or be put into storage and create problems over time. So that's what typically happens with the pesticides we're taking in with these products. You know, our liver does its best to eradicate this stuff. But if it's overwhelmed, um, most pesticides and herbicides are fat soluble. They end up in fat sol um, storage. So, um, so that's true, Sally. Yep. If you see a non-GMO project label, it is non-GMO. So you do want to see the organic label on it as well. Um, in Canada, like I said, an organic is non-GMO by definition. And it's also organic, meaning that that is different in the United States. That's a labeling difference that we see. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's it, you can have a non-organic, non-GMO. So if you've spent your life eating that stuff, you have to um, do some work to get them out. And yeah, Holly, we did talk about the Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen that's um, produced by the Environmental Working Group. We actually had a whole lecture about that in Environmental Toxins. Um, so we've, we've talked about this a couple of times on the webinars. And so um, that is also, of course, pulling out things that, generally speaking, are going to be highly treated by pesticides and herbicides. But there's... Um, more fruits and vegetables, obviously, that are treated with herbicides and pesticides that are not genetically modified as well. So ways of detoxing. Um, first and foremost, eat a nutritionist diet. We've totally talked about this before. If you have not seen the plate that shows the best diet, go back to the lectures on diet. If you have never done the course Start Here, Start Now, that's an 18 lecture course that we did a couple of years ago. Um, go look at that course at wlmlearning.com. There's lots of like starter, here's what you need to know about for your health purposes kind of course. Um, you sometimes need to address nutrient deficiencies that support detox. So use one of the medical food cleanses that I usually recommend, the Metagenics one. Um, you can um, get those. Those are professional products, but you can actually get them from our Metagenics store which is um, agol.metagenicscanada.com. So these are the things like Ultra Clear or Ultra Clear Plus. Those are brilliant liver detoxes that will help. You can supplement with detoxification agents that move fat-soluble toxins. So those are the things like Prime Chlorella and Cilantro um, Tea or Cilantrex, the capsule. We also use the Iteris um, Renalex HecoCure detox kits that improve the movement of fluids through detox organs. Um, sweating through the sauna is useful in detox, um, especially if you already have those detox agents and the nutrients ready. It's really important also from a dietary perspective to like eat fibers. Fibers actually can help you to move some of these things out. So they basically can grab certain types of things, but fat soluble toxins within your digestive tract, and they just facilitate taking them out of the system. So when you look at the idealist um, diet, there's lots of fiber in that diet. And there's the insoluble fibers and the soluble fibers. So things like, you know, dark leafy greens and vegetable skins and, you know, whole grains and um, pectiny things like apples and pears. And um, soluble fibers can also be found in like other kinds of seeds and nuts. And you're going to get a nice, if you're a good overall eater, and you are doing a good job of the basic ballpark plate, you're going to really have a lot of um, oomph to get rid of as much as you can actually get rid of without doing something more dramatic. But if you're doing that consistently, it's really useful. The other thing you can do is make sure you're eating ferments in your diet. Put normal um, organisms in to communicate to your flora what's going on in the bigger world. Because like I said, bacterial organisms talk to each other. And so you're going to see that when you put in ferments, like, you know, a tablespoon of raw sauerkraut, and it has to be the raw ones, the ones that aren't pasteurized, um, like kombucha, um, kefir, miso, fermented vegetables that are lacto-fermented. Um, you don't need huge amounts of them. You just need enough of those organisms to have a conversation with your own <laughs> and to support 
the continued growth and development of your own normal organisms. So um, it's going to be a bit of a process if you've never not avoided these things before. But if you have, you know, chances are if you're eating a good diet, you're doing a pretty good job of mitigating some of the risk. Now, I know I've talked at you for already an hour. Solid. I got a little excited there for a second. <laughs> so I just want to remind you that we are going to do some more um, webinars for the till the end of the year here. Um, so we have three more in our fall series. Um, so one's introducing adaptogens, which is about how do you take in plants that help you to mitigate stress. Um, we're going to do anti-aging secrets, which I'm sure everybody will be super keen, thrilled about. And then we're also going to do one on eczema because it's a very common complaint we get in clinic. Um, December, we're probably going to do the Holy Nights meditations. Um, so that's actually 12 um, meditations. So if you're a meditator, you keep in tune for that. And in 2021, we've also got a couple of really cool topics planned out. Now, um, I think that's mostly what I wanted to say. So, you know, thank you so much for attending this. I, it always means a lot to me, you know, that so many people sign up and attend and watch the replays of these um, uh, webinars for your information. And if you have questions, or concerns, or you, you need some help to figure out how to make these kinds of changes for yourself or your family, you know, come talk to me about it. Because I'll tell you, I came from, I came from Alberta originally. <laughs> and so um, we'll see, you know, we'll see if we can just help you. So I hope you all do so awesome this week. And like I said, think really hard with your next food choices vote with your dollars that's what we all do we vote with how we spend our money and if you vote on organics and non-genetically modified foods it sends a message a really strong message and that sometimes for all of us is is um, one of the best things we can do so i hope you all have a great evening thanks for coming and i'll see you soon take care guys bye Thanks for watching. I love to connect to my patient community to inform and inspire, and I hope you'll join us again in the near future. Don't forget to check out whole-life-medicine.com for more webinars and events.